Introduction Hi, my name is Mikey Robbins, and can I start off by saying I am not a historian, nor am I a chef, and I'm definitely not a theologian. But I was once a fat Catholic 10-year-old whose only two regular appointments outside of school were Mass on a Sunday and a Weight Watchers meeting on a Wednesday. So I got indoctrinated into associating pleasure with guilt from an early age. It was, after all, the Catholic Church that gave us the concept of the seven deadly sins. Well, that is basically true. The concept of bad or immoral behaviour in the Western world can be traced back to Aristotle's writings on ethics, or in the Roman world, the musings of Horace, who was a brilliant writer and a bit of a judgmental old bugger. Christian thinking about a list of sins that offend more than others is seen in the work of the 4th century Greek monk Evagrius Ponticus, who listed eight evil thoughts, which are pretty much the seven deadly sins, with the somewhat bizarre addition of dejection. I mean, quite frankly, that sounds more than a bit needy. It almost goes without saying that along the way, Thomas Aquinas put his two bobs worth on the nature of sinning. Good old reliable Thomas Aquinas. The man had more opinions than I've had green chicken curries, and I really like green chicken curries. We'll no doubt hear from him a bit later. What we know as the seven deadly sins is from the work of Pope Gregory I, who in 590 took the previous writings on sin and then by using biblical examples gave us the seven sins that would guarantee us a bizarre range of tortures in hell. Mind you, it's not all doom and gloom with Gregory. He's also the patron saint of musicians, singers, students and teachers, which is kind of cool, I guess. But he's mostly remembered for his writings, most of which are on hell and damnation. Do this, don't do that. And boy, he was down on earthly pleasures, which does beg the question, just how did he become patron saint of all those fun-loving occupations? This was in stark contrast to the ancient Greek wisdom of Epicurus who proclaimed these words from around 300 years before the common era. The beginning and root of all good is the pleasure of the stomach. Even wisdom and culture must be referred to this. Wise words indeed, and so different to the somewhat odd concept of explaining to a 10-year-old that if you don't give up paddle pops for Lent, the baby Jesus will be sad. Consider this. Most organised religions have far more rules and restrictions around food consumption than they do around sex. Muslims and Jews have extensive rules and rituals for eating, many to show their devotion and many founded in the common sense food safety practices that you would expect from desert cultures. Buddhists are primarily vegetarians. Well, it sort of comes and goes. Seriously, how could the Buddha have gotten that delightfully chubby on a strict vegan diet? In various faiths, some foods are taboo all the time, some on special days, and some can't be mixed with others. It's a theological game of Russian roulette every time you sit down for a meal. Let me give you a rather strange example of this battle between the soul and the stomach from the latter part of the 17th century. Francois de Laval was by then the first bishop of the North American French run province of Quebec. Back then, holy days were far more prevalent than today. Some years it seemed that every other day was a holy day. Now, the people of Quebec had developed something of a taste for beaver. The animals were plentiful, easy to hunt, and apparently barbecued up a treat. People were loath to give them up every time the church declared a holy day. Here's where the good bishop came to the rescue. He mounted an argument in a letter to the church that, due to the beaver's mostly aquatic habits, there were compelling reasons that the mammal could be classified as a fish. The church agreed, and a special dispensation was granted for the good folk of Quebec to continue their beaver barbecuing ways which just shows us, well, just how willing the church was to compromise when it came to the new world. 
They would also go on to include muskrats, capybaras, and even alligators as fish, just to keep their foothold in the Americas safe. The most obvious of the seven deadly sins to associate with food is gluttony. And this is fair enough. But allow me to go back to my previous point regarding food and sex taboos. While it is, I guess, possible to refrain from sex, it is impossible to refrain from food without dying. Food is a permanent part of our lives. It does more than sustain us. It gives us pleasure. It can give us status. It fills emotional gaps in some people while becoming an obsession with others. We covet food. We go to war for and with food. We seduce with food. We use food to show off. We hoard it, we profit from it, and we also overindulge in it. As Sir Thomas Aquinas once said, the things that we love tell us who we are. And that is just as true in these sectarian days as it was in the Middle Ages. To be honest, the behaviour described by the seven deadly sins was pretty much as antisocial in ancient Egypt as it is today. Sure, we might not be risking eternal damnation, but bad behaviour is still considered just plain rude. Because eating is so primal to our nature, we can often go to strange and bizarre lengths to satisfy whatever urge we have that food satiates. Or as a friend of mine once said, where there is food, there is folly. Which brings me to one of the weirdest stories that concerns our sinful relationship with food. There have been times when sin could actually be consumed as food. I'm not talking about the transubstantiation of the communion wafer, but of something more folkloric in nature. The job of a sin eater has its origins in medieval times, and it had pretty much died out by the 17th century. It started by the local gentry offering food and ale to the poor of the parish to pray for the souls of the dearly departed. This practice evolved over the centuries until it became this person's role to literally consume the sins of someone who had recently passed. The sin eater would usually eat bread and drink ale while sitting near the corpse. That way, the sins of the dead could be passed into the living and their souls could enter heaven free from whatever transgressions they may have committed in their mortal life. Although sometimes practiced in Europe, sin eating was particularly popular in Britain. As weird as it sounds, the peculiar ritual saw a massive resurgence in rural England, Ireland and Wales from the middle of the 18th century through Victorian times. The last recorded sin eater, Richard Munslow of Shropshire, England, passed away as recently as 1906. The ritual did not vary much from funeral to funeral. The body would lie in state, often in the family home. The coffin would be open and a loaf of bread placed on the corpse's chest, sometimes on a mound of salt. A jug or a bowl of ale would also be present, usually placed next to the deceased's head. What would follow next was described in the 1813 book Brand's Popular Antiquities of Great Britain, which tells us how the sin eater sat facing the door. They gave him a groat, about four shillings, which he put in his pocket, a crust of bread which he ate, and a bowlful of ale which he drank off at a draught. After this, getting up from his stool, he pronounced with a composed gesture the ease and the rest of the soul departed for which he would pawn his own soul. This concept of consuming sins was not only to save the souls of the dead, but also to protect the superstitious mourners left behind. One popular sin eater's coffin side speech read, I give easement and rest now to thee, dear man. Come not down our lanes or in our meadows, and for thy peace I pawn my soul. There you go. Sin eating gets loved ones into heaven and keeps their ghost from your lanes and meadows. Not bad for four shillings and leftover bread and beer. As I stated before, where there is food, there is folly. Once you throw in a bit of sin for good measure, 
things can really get a bit weird. 